Many of Kuhn's critics were appalled by these claims. For if paradigm shifts work the way Kuhn says, it is hard to see how science can be regarded as a rational activity at all. Surely scientists are meant to base their beliefs on evidence and reason, not on faith and peer pressure. Faced with two competing paradigms, surely the scientist should make an objective comparison of them to determine which has more evidence in its favor. Undergoing a conversion experience, or allowing oneself to be persuaded by the most forceful of one's fellow scientists, hardly seems like a rational way to behave. Kuhn's account of paradigm shifts seems hard to reconcile with the familiar positivist image of science as an objective, rational activity. One critic wrote that on Kuhn's account, theory choice in science was a matter for mob psychology. Kuhn also made some controversial claims about the overall direction of scientific change. According to a widely held view, science progresses towards the truth in a linear fashion, as older, incorrect ideas get replaced by newer, correct ones. Later theories are thus objectively better than earlier ones. This cumulative conception of science is popular among laymen and scientists alike. But Kuhn argued that it is both historically inaccurate and philosophically naive. For example, he noted that Einstein's theory of relativity is in some respects more similar to Aristotelian than Newtonian theory. So the history of mechanics is not simply a linear progression from wrong to right. Moreover, Kuhn questioned whether the concept of objective truth actually makes sense at all. The idea that there is a fixed set of facts about the world, independent of any particular paradigm, was of dubious coherence, he believed. Kuhn suggested a radical alternative. The facts about the world are paradigm relative, and thus change when paradigms change. If this suggestion is right, then it makes no sense to ask whether a given theory corresponds to the facts as they really are, nor, therefore, to ask whether it is objectively true. Truth itself becomes relative to a paradigm. Incommensurability and the theory-ladenness of data. Kuhn had two main philosophical arguments for these claims. Firstly, he argued that competing paradigms are typically incommensurable with one another. To understand this idea, we must remember that for Kuhn, a scientist's paradigm determines her entire worldview. She views everything through the paradigm's lens. So, when an existing paradigm is replaced by a new one in a scientific revolution, scientists have to abandon the whole conceptual framework which they use to make sense of the world. Indeed, Kuhn even claims, obviously somewhat metaphorically, that before and after a paradigm shift, scientists live in different worlds. Incommensurability is the idea that two paradigms may be so different as to render impossible any straightforward comparison of them with each other. There is no common language into which both can be translated. As a result, the proponents of different paradigms fail to make complete contact with each other's viewpoints, Kuhn claimed. This is an interesting, if somewhat vague, idea. The doctrine of incommensurability stems largely from Kuhn's belief that scientific concepts derive their meaning from the theory in which they play a role. So, to understand Newton's concept of mass, for example, we need to understand the whole of Newtonian theory. Concepts cannot be explained independently of the theories in which they are embedded. This idea, which is sometimes called holism, was taken very seriously by Kuhn. He argued that the term mass actually meant something different for Newton and Einstein, since the theories in which each embedded the term were so different. This implies that Newton and Einstein were, in effect, speaking different languages, which obviously complicates the attempt to choose between their theories. If a Newtonian and an Einsteinian physicist tried to have a rational discussion, 
they would end up talking past each other. Kuhn used the incommensurability thesis both to rebut the view that paradigm shifts are fully objective and to bolster his non-cumulative picture of the history of science. Traditional philosophy of science saw no huge difficulty in choosing between competing theories. You simply make an objective comparison of them in the light of the available evidence and decide which is better. But this clearly presumes that there is a common language in which both theories can be expressed. If Kuhn is right that proponents of old and new paradigms are quite literally talking past each other, no such simplistic account of paradigm choice can be correct. Incommensurability is equally problematic for the traditional linear picture of scientific history. If old and new paradigms are incommensurable, then it cannot be correct to think of scientific revolutions as the replacement of wrong ideas by right ones. For to call one idea right and another wrong implies the existence of a common framework for evaluating them, which is precisely what Kuhn denies. Incommensurability implies that scientific change, far from being a straightforward progression towards the truth, is, in a sense, directionless. Later paradigms are not better than earlier ones, just different. Not many philosophers were convinced by Kuhn's incommensurability thesis. Part of the problem was that Kuhn also claimed old and new paradigms to be incompatible. This claim is very plausible, for if old and new paradigms were not incompatible, there would be no need to choose between them. And in many cases, the incompatibility is obvious. The Ptolemaic claim that the planets revolve around the Earth is obviously incompatible with the Copernican claim that they revolve around the Sun. But, as Kuhn's critics were quick to point out, if two things are incommensurable, then they cannot be incompatible. To see why not, consider the proposition that an object's mass depends on its velocity. Einstein's theory says this proposition is true, while Newton's says it is false. But, if the doctrine of incommensurability is right, then there is no actual disagreement between Newton and Einstein here, for the proposition means something different for each. Only if the proposition has the same meaning in both theories, that is, only if there is no incommensurability is there a genuine conflict between the two. Since everybody, including Kuhn, agrees that Einstein's and Newton's theories do conflict, that is strong reason to regard the incommensurability thesis with suspicion.